Hi everyone, my name is Ernava Kopoulos. I'm the Senior Recruitment Manager at the Executive MBA of the University of St. Gallen. And today I want to welcome you to our webinar in Digital Transformation, which will be given by our Academic Director, Dr. Caroline Frankenberg. This webinar has been structured in two parts. One, we will have the general presentation and then we will have a Q&A session. However, feel free to contact us at any time, post your questions whenever you something pops up and you really want to start clarifying that you don't forget about it at the end, okay? So now I want to welcome Caroline. Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Edna. Welcome everybody. I'm very happy to talk about digital transformation and how to master digital transformation with business model innovation. Um, okay. Let me start the presentation. Okay. Great, so it's a very important topic, digital transformation, and in order to better understand why you are here and if it's important for you as well, I would like to start with a small survey. So the first question is, in which industry are you in to get a better feeling who is with us today? I'm looking at the responses, so let's see. Um, you can click on your screen so that we get the, I think. Okay, now it's moving. Um, yeah, we have finance, we have chemicals, and we have the education sector, media. Okay, come some traditional industries like chemicals, finance, and um, education, retail. So we have broad variety there. Thank you very much. Then I would like to go to the next one. Um, is the topic digital transformation on the top management agenda in your organization? Okay, um, the number is very high. Okay, so it's a key topic and so you're all interested in this topic. And then the last one, how do you assess the progress regarding digital transformation in your own company? Is it zero to 25? So you're rather at the start, is it 25 to 50? Is it 50 to 75 or is it 75 to 100 percent? Okay. Um, I think, yeah, it's kind of, um, but I'm, I'm just checking here in which industry are you in? So that's fine. Um, okay. Just to click here, um, I still see the... Okay, let's just move on. I think it's fine. I guess it's all important for you and we'll test it for the um, next survey. So I have this, okay. So why is it so important, digital transformation? What does it really mean? And I do a lot of research in this field currently and we came up with a kind of those, this model that you see on the slide, which is composed of three, dimension. So the first one is really why to act. Why is it so important? Isn't it just a buzzword or do we all need to kind of really go into the digital transformation? First question. The second one, what do we need to do? So what does it really mean? What is the digital strategy about and what, what do we need to do in order to um, come up with a digital strategy? And the last one, the third one is really then the how to do it. So even if you have the best idea about how your digital business model could look like, it's, it's so difficult to implement it and to make it real and to make it happen. And I really want to talk about this topic as well. And I'm, as I said, I'm doing a lot of research in this field currently. And we, we have just finished a survey with like um, 80 companies around the world where we did interviews, um, collected cases, etc. And we really learned a lot about what it takes in order to be successful. And I want to share this experience with you in the next 30 minutes. So why is it so important? Why is it we read it everywhere? So I guess all of you have heard about it. Um, there are tons of articles out there which talk about digital transformation. So what, what really is digital transformation? First of all, it's important that you really understand there's a, a big difference between digitization and digital transformation. So the first one, and it really means just to 
to make some products um, more digital, to make processes digital. So something you had on a paper is now electronically, etc. So this is digitalization. And this is one thing, and it's also important, but that's not digital transformation. And if you only do a digitalization, you will not be successful. And a lot of companies and a lot of executives still do not understand this. So there are really two dimensions. So you need to improve your core business. You need to digitalize it for sure. You need to digitalize your processes. But on the other hand, you also need to think about digital transformation. And what does that mean? Digital transformation really means you need to think about totally reinventing your business. So how could your business in the digital age look like? So what are the, the new business models? What is the logic of doing business? And we see that in some industries that new startups or digital natives really change the um, business model entirely. And it hasn't happened in all industries, but we see it in more and more industries. So it's really about fundamentally changing the way we do business and that's digital transformation. And it's important that you get this because otherwise you will not be successful and you will not master the digital transformation. So what happens exactly? So what we see currently in, in, in some industries is that digital natives enter established industries or new startups enter established industries and they use existing technologies. They do not necessarily, and that's also important, they do not necessarily invent those technologies. They use those technologies and deploy it in an industry with a new fascinating business model. And by doing that, they disrupt an established industry. Just think of Uber, think of Airbnb, all those famous examples we all know. They never invented the technology, but they used the technology and disrupted a traditional industry. And typically, these are startups and um, digital natives, but there are also some examples of like established companies, but we'll come to that later. But what is interesting now, and that's also different to what we learned in the past. So what is um, in the past, if you think about this McKinsey Three Horizons model, maybe some of you are familiar with it. This one um, explained us, okay, um, incremental innovation or like changing or adapting your business model, you can do that like within one year, but if you, and then if you, and the second horizon was if you want to go in a new market with your business model, that takes you maybe two years, but then the most disruptive steps, the, the, this takes you three, four, five years. And so we always thought disruption takes us um, a lot of time. So you kind of see that on this chart, it takes time to develop it, to, to um, bring it to the market, and then to find the customers. But this changed fundamentally. Nowadays, disruption can be really quick. You don't really need a lot of years in order to be successful. Disruption can be as quick as incremental innovation. And that's important to understand because this really changes the logic, how we deal with innovation, how we do our strategies, how we need to think about our processes. Disruption can happen quite quickly. And therefore, a lot of startups have an advantage because they don't have the legacy business and they are more agile, they are quicker, etc. And you kind of, and that's kind of what I want to bring across with this chart. So if you if we go into disruption with new technologies or deploying the technologies, you can offer services that are cheaper, that are better, that are more customized, and that are best, better integrated. And therefore, you get the customers on your platform, um, on your new business model, and, and this makes all those companies so successful. And with the winner takes it all, I do not want to mention the ABBA song, but it really means so if you have the right business model with the right time in the right industry, then you can see those effects that you get like directly a lot of customers on your business, business on your platform. So how do I see that? So what happens in a lot of industries? So what we see is, um, and I really like this chart because it explains a bit what, what happens currently in a lot of industries. You have those three layers. So the one is the one we are all familiar with, the one, um, the, the, the lowest layer, it's the one where we create content and where we create products. So we develop cars, we develop, we, we create newspapers, we create the content for the newspapers, et cetera. We have boxes, et cetera. So we all kind of are familiar with this field. And in the past, we kind of developed that, we produced it, and then we gave it to our customers. And we had kind of a direct contact with our customers. But what happens nowadays is that we have this new thin layer which sits on top of the suppliers. And, and the risky thing is that this thin layer takes us away our customers because they have the direct contact to the customers. And what happens then, so it's for the customers, it's, not, it's nice because again, as, as, as we saw on the previous slide, they can offer more customized services. They know what the customers want, et cetera. They can offer cheaper services, et cetera. 
But what happens to the, and also for the intermediate layer, for them it's also attractive because they have the contact with the customers. But as you can imagine, it's not very attractive for the lower layer. So what happens to those companies? They are now not having, they, they don't have the direct customer contact anymore, but they are only suppliers to the second um, intermediate layer. So this means the power now is with the intermediate layer. They have the contact to the customers and the, the lower layer, they have to just deliver their products. And that means they are just one supplier like another supplier. So it gets kind of, they get interchangeably. So it doesn't really matter whom you choose and the power is really with the layer in between. And we need to be careful that not, that this does not happen to your industry as well, because it has happened already in some industries, but not in all industries. And you can, if you are aware of what that means and what digital transformation means, you can also try to move into this second layer in order to keep the contact to the customers and to make the difference in your industry. Digitalization is increasing competition. So no company can afford not to think about digital transformation because all industries will change and there will be a disruption in all the industries. So I kind of see, I kind of like this chart as well. So it, we have a competitive um, field and digitalization is increasing competition and it's shrinking profit pools. Because what you can see here, it's okay, you have your traditional competitors, you can see them on the left hand side. So kind of the laggards that continue what they did in the past and just continue doing that. And then you have but then you have some direct competitors that might dis have decided to transform, so they might be a bit better than you. Then you have startups coming from either the same industry, but they are more agile, they have no legacy business, etc. And then you have startups coming from under other industries that might also enter your industry because they know a lot about data and data gets more important, etc. And industry boundaries are blurring, so they can kind of enter your industry as well. And then you also have like digital natives from other industries, like the big ones, the digital companies, or you have might even have a direct competitors that has already started to transform earlier than you, and now is kind of already executing a platform strategy. And then obviously you have like the, the big ones, like the Amazons, the Alibabas, um, and you never know what they are up to. So Alibaba, for example, goes, thinks about or already is in the process of going into the insurance industry and um, Apple going in the finance industry. So you have those um, companies as well that are going to enter the traditional industries. So you see there's a big, there, there's, there's a lot going on in your industry and you need to pay attention where you are, which fish are you in the game? Are you kind of rather um, leading the, the group or are you rather lagging behind? So, and what is your strategy? Even if you're not leading, but what is your strategy? What is your answer if, if those disruptor, disruptors will enter your industry? So I think the most important question that you should um, ask yourself is what if, Google or what if Alibaba would enter my industry? What do I need to do in order to have an answer, in order to be competitive, and in order to sustain, to sustain my competitive advantage? It's not that foreign credit Swiss, the UBS is the most relevant competitor. It's really about the digital natives, the, the startup companies, and they, can, they, they are the, um, the ones you should look at. Okay, um, and then um, why is it so important? Why is it so difficult? And why, why is it for us such a challenge to do this digital transformation? And I see it like this double S curve. And um, for me, it's, we are all coming from an established industry. We have an established business model, but our business model is not working um, very well anymore. And at least we see that the margin is shrinking, that other players are entering the industry. So we are typically all on the red curve. And depending on the industry, you might be on a different point on this red curve, but this red curve, was we were successful in the past, profits were increasing, but we see kind of a drop in our margin. We see that it gets more and more difficult, that competition is, is tougher. And then at some point of time, probably our current business model will go down and will not be relevant anymore. And it will put us out of the market if we are not aware of that and if we are not thinking about coming up with a new business model. And that's kind of displayed here. You have to think about a separate, a new, a disruptive business model. And this is the green curve. You have to start now. You have to start tomorrow with thinking about it if you have not done it already. And then just try out. And that's not necessarily only one business model. These are different business models, different projects, different initiatives. Where you think about how can you disrupt your own industry? How can you cannibalize your current business model in order to think about something really different and that helps you to 
to come to this to, to get on the second curve and then at some point of time this green curve might overtake the red curve and then you are you have something that you can use in order to that gives you um, sustained competitive advantage in the future what is also interesting i just read that yesterday in an article so the average lifetime of a standard and poor 500 listed company maybe some of you has has read that as well came down to 15 years and it used to be 60 just need to check it but it, it used to be 67 years in 1958 so it's a drop by 80 percent and just imagine what does that mean so it's because a lot of companies did not recognize that their business model is not relevant anymore and they weren't prepared and they didn't know about this chart that they need to invest in the green curve early enough in order to be prepared when the market changes, when the disruptors are there, that you can also play in this new market. What is also important, success on both curves is key to, su to success. So you need to invest in the red and in the green curve. So you need to digitize your products, you need to digitize your processes. But in addition to that, you also need to think about disrupting your own business model. Um, so what you do, um, what does it take in order to be successful and in order to master the digital transformation? So the key really is it's about business model innovation. And you can read that in a lot of articles or so academics, practitioners, they really came to the conclusion, if you want to master the digital transformation, you need to think about business model innovation. You need to think about disrupting your own business model. It's not about technologies. You need to have the technologies and you need to understand them, but you don't need to invent them. And therefore, it doesn't take you years to invent the technology, but you can just take the technologies that are there like blockchain, blockchain AI, et cetera, and think about what does it mean for my industry? What does it mean for my business model? How can I use, apply those technologies in order to disrupt my own business model? So what is a business model? Um, just quickly, it's about um, four dimension. It's really about the, what do you offer to the customer? What is your value proposition? What, what, what is the offering? What is the USP that you give to the customer? Then the how, how is the value proposition created? So do you do it on your own? Do you do it with partners um, in collaboration? Um, then the revenue model. So how, how do we make money? How do we make profits? This is about the revenue mechanism. And then obviously the who, the customer, should be still in the center of every new business model because it's about value creation for our customers. And therefore, we really need to think about customers' needs, customer journeys, et cetera, to target our business model rightly for our customers or for our future customers and business model innovation now means um, changing at least two out of those four dimensions so if you only change one like the what it would be more product innovation if you change the how it's more process innovation but as soon as you change two or more it's a business model innovation and also business model innovation should lead you can see that on the left hand side um, needs to lead to value creation and value capture because if you only create value for your customers, that's also nice. But ultimately, you need to make sure that you can capture value for your own organization. And this does not necessarily need to mean revenues. It can also mean like user bases, et cetera. And then you can um, use the users in order to make money later on. But you need to think about how can I capture value out of this new business model. OK, so um, now we all know that business model innovation is important. We all know that digital transformation is important. But why is it the case that we still see so few cases of really disruptive business model innovations, especially coming from incumbent firms and especially coming from Europe as well? So 92% of companies say, and this number is increasing and increasing, so nowadays it's 92% of companies say they need to transform their business model, but only 10% really do it or you really see results. Why? And I think one of the, and we previously we did a lot of research in that field, what we figured out is that it's really about um, getting, thinking outside the box, thinking, this, thinking um, differently, thinking about um, how you can do something different and getting out of the dominant logic of your industry. And typically you're in your industry, you're talking to suppliers, to customers, to complementers and they all kind of have the same dominant logic that's how we do business but that's the that's the case here you need to think about it differently that's tough and that's challenging and therefore and it, it takes it therefore you need to do brave steps to do something really differently and that's so difficult and therefore a lot of companies already struggle here and doing something totally different 
So breaking through the dominant industry logic and think outside the box. I think I'm going to skip this survey, but because due to time reasons, but just to let you know, so there's a study in, in the US and this guy um, looked at what, how is the capability of thinking the creatively um, changing when kids get older. So there was a group of 1,600 kids and what he uh, analyzed is he, he observed those kids when they grew up and he analyzed how their capability to think divergently um, changes over time. And what he figured out that the three to five years old, they have the highest probability to be to think creatively. So the, out of the three to five years old, 98% um, can think outside of the box. So they think differently, they do not have those structures, etc. so they are really creative. And then the same kids, the same um, group of kids, the same questions adapted to the age, couple of years later when they were eight to 10 years old. And that's amazing. Now the, the, the percentage of those kids that are able to think creatively and divergently came down from 98% to 32%. So there's a huge drop. Now they start with kindergarten, getting in primary school, and they get those structures, they get exercises, they have math and German and whatever. So they really lose their, their capability to be creative. And then um, the third one, the third group, again, the same, the same kids. Now they grew, they turned older, they, they became adults, but it's like 25 years and plus. And now the number goes down to 2%. So only 2% are really able to think outside the box. So what does that mean for us and our organizations? There are 2% of all our staff that are able to think creatively. Probably those 2% are not the ones that are the CEOs or the the head of the CDOs, etc. How can we find them? How can we um, put them in charge? Or how can we even increase the number? How can we all get more, become more creative? And interestingly, in the in the new report of the World Economic Forum, they always have those um, surveys: which ones are the most important capabilities and skills employees need in the future? And creativity was like one of the top three. And it really changed in the last report, it was like number 10, and now it moved up to being one of the top three. So creativity is really a core, core skill we need to have because all the analytical stuff can be done by machines in the future, but creativity is something humans need to do. And therefore it's so important to focus on that topic. Um, we did a study, so we really looked at that. We did intensive research, detailed analysis of all major successful business model innovations in the last 50 years. And our idea was really to find something that helps you to be creative again, to increase this, this percentage from 2% to I don't know, 100% ideally. So that was the idea. And we, we did a lot of research, case studies, et cetera. And the good news is we found something. And the very good news is it's, it's, it works very well because we have tried it hundreds of times already with different companies, different settings, um, different executives involved. And it's really a nice methodology in order to be creative. So what is it? Here's the result kind of the business model innovation map. It shows you that there are, the, the core, it looks a bit complex, but the basic idea is, is easy. So it really, um, it really tells us that all the big names, all the big inno innovators that we know, they, are, they didn't really do something totally new. So what they did, they copied business models from other industries and then used them in their industry. And by copying and transferring this business model to their own industry, they could disrupt their own industry. And all those different colors are like basic business model patterns that you can use in order to disrupt your own industry. And those names in there are the disruptors of their own industry. And that always shows which patterns they used. So just to explain it a bit more, the razor and blade pattern. So that means products are basic product is cheap and the consumables that are needed to be used or operated are expensive and sold at high margin. So you can see there are different companies that use that pattern. For example, Gillette, like with the razor, you get the razor cheap, but then the plates are expensive. Hewlett and Packard in the printing industry, the same idea. And they always use the same pattern, but by using it in a different industry, you could disrupt your own industry. And basically there are three strategies. You can transfer it, you can combine it, and you can leverage it. So you can just transfer it from one industry to the other. You can combine different patterns, or you can even leverage it within your own organization. This brings us to the learning of this first study that we have had that we did. So 90% of all business model innovations are recombinations. And that surprised us. So it's really that the number is so high. We thought maybe 40, 50, but it's really 90% of all those big 
names that we know, they, they, they just use something that was already there. And there are 55 patterns to systematically innovate your own business model. And therefore, and that's the key message, kind of business model innovation is craft rather than art. Everybody, all of you can be creative. You can start tomorrow with being creative and thinking about how can you disrupt your own business model. You don't need a Steve Jobs, you don't need the kids, so you can really learn it on your own and you can really do it in your own organization. So these are then, there are some cards um, that, that kind of reflect the 55 patterns so you can nicely use them in workshops together with your colleagues and then kind of um, confront those business models with your business model and then think about, okay, how would, Rolls Royce conduct our business? How would Google do our business if they would be in our business? What would Amazon do differently if they would be in our business? And, and by, by thinking about those companies, you might come up with a great and innovative idea. And this all kind of gets integrated in the business model navigator. And we wrote a book about that and what's translated in more than 12 languages. And so there's really a need not only in Switzerland or in Europe, but it's also in China, Japanese and um, language that it got translated. So there's a huge need worldwide how to really think about business model innovation. I want to um, skip that one in order to have some time for the questions. So, but let me let me spend some time on the how. So, why is it now we know now we know why it is important and we know what we need to do. We need to come up with a disruptive new idea. But how can we really do that? And here you can see new concepts. No, no matter how good, are often blocked in the organization. So for example, this guy here, look here, I just invented writing. And then the other one said, well, thank you. You just made us all illiterate. So it does not always mean that your employees appreciate new ideas, appreciate radically new business models. And therefore it's so um, important that you, that you are aware of that and you can know how to deal with that topic. So it's really, and now getting back to this curve that I presented at the beginning, it's time for true ambidexterity. So, organizations need to act on the red and on the green curve because you have teams that need to focus, still focus on the red curve, on the core business. You cannot focus all your energy and all your staff and all your employees and all your great people to put them on the green curve. No, you also need the red curve because you need the money, you need the, the knowledge, and later on you need the management skills in order to scale the business. So it's important and it's also a benefit that we do have that as established companies. We just need to know how we play the game, that we stabilize and optimize our core digitized processes, digitized products, et cetera, but also invent in the future. Think about a separate business unit. Think about how can you leverage entrepreneurs. Think about new digital business models and ideally combine them both, that they interact with each other, but that they are separated enough so that they can both focus on their, on their business. Um, I think I'm gonna skip that one as, as well, it's just time-wise, but I, I, I let you know the, um, the results. So how many digital transformation attempts fail in implementation? And um, the sad answer is 84% fail. So it's only 16% that are successful. And this number is even higher than the one that we know from usual change projects. So for usual change projects, it's 70, 30, but for digital transformation, it's even higher. It's 84 um, versus 16 percent. And the second question then, what are the main reasons for the failure in implementation? Is it insufficient resources and budget? Is it employee resistance to change? Is it top management does not support the change or other reasons? And I do a lot of executive education seminars and also consulting projects, etc. And I always, always hear the first one. They always say, oh, Ms. Frankenberger, we don't have the resources. We don't have the time. We don't have the budget. We just cannot do anything. But that's not true. So the main reason is not the first one. It's B and C. It's that the employees resist to change. Not everybody wants to have change, as you saw in this nice comic picture. Not everybody wants to, to change. Not everybody wants to, to be different. Again, there's also a survey. Only 13% of employees are, are motivated in their, in their work. Only 13% on average. So what does that mean? Employees just go to work and then they do it in order to get the paycheck. And then they go home to do their sports, see their family, but they are not really engaged in being in their company. That's the engagement survey thing. So that means if they are not engaged and now they need to change because of some digital stuff and some new startups and, and things like that, they probably are not really a fan of doing that. They probably don't want to do that. So how can you, 
how can you make sure that they want to do that, that they are engaged, that they are motivated to change? And what is the story that you give them, etc.? And also see top management does not support the change. A lot of top managers just see their top management position as a step in their career to, to advance, to get a better job, to, to get a better position within the organization. So why should they invest in something that is highly risky, that is only in 16% of the cases successful? Why should they do that? What's the reasoning for that? It doesn't really make sense if they focus on their core business, optimize their core business, then they can show the results at the end. Hey, I overachieved my budget. Here, look, great. I can um, go on to get the next, to do the next step in my career. It's much easier. It's much more comfortable. It's much more secure if you go that way rather than investing tons of um, money at some point of time, energy, et cetera, in something that might not be successful. So here you can see the numbers, 84 to 16%. And here you can see this other one, 39% is the reasons contributing, factors contributing to failure is the employee resistance, and 33% is the management behavior not supportive of change. And this is a question that really um, interested me a lot. So how, what can we do? How can we really um, help organizations to, to, um, to get better there and to, to be successful with the transformations? now that we know already that it's about the soft factors and uh, two years ago i started a big research project and that is still ongoing but kind of we are in the process of collecting and analyzing the results so it's really about the and i want to share a bit with you the what, what we are thinking currently so it's really about the soft factors what happens with me what happens to my company and um currently what we see is this digital transformation engine so it's really about institute the right leadership, the right people and the culture. You need to have the people that have the skills for digital transformation. You need to have the people that are willing to change. You need to have the people that are open to collaborate with other organizations. You need to have the leaders that are able to lead on the red curve and on the green curve. There are not a lot of people out there that are able to do that. Either they are good on the green or on the red, but people that can do, or leaders that are able to do both, both things in parallel is quite hard to find. You need to think about the culture. And also technology, you do not need to develop technology, but you need to understand the technology. You need to understand what is the impact of this technology for my business? How will it affect my business? You need to have the right organizational structure, thinking about internal startups or kind of separate units that are not influenced by the core business. And you need to have the right processes like testing strategies and et cetera, the right governance mechanism. So just to, to, um, to, to finish up with that topic, and as said, it's, research is ongoing, but we try to publish our book um, at the end of the year. So I think we are, um, I can then share with you a bit more of the results. So here, just skills-wise, so the left-hand side is more on the red curve, and the right-hand side is on the green curve. So coming from leadership, command, and control to entrepreneurial leadership, coming from KPIs, like we are very much focusing on EBIT, return on investment, return on assets on the core business. But on the green curve, you cannot do that. There is no return on, on investment necessarily because you don't know what is the return. Or maybe in the first years, do, you do not even earn money. It's about moonshots. So how can I achieve this moonshot? How can I make it a big thing? How can I scale my business? What are the number of users? This one is the left foot of a fight for each percent of the market share. On the right-hand side, it's about the winner takes it all that I explained at the beginning. So if you have the right business model and the right industry, then you can be successful. Yes, I need to. And then organizational structure, I think I already mentioned that. You have some startups um, within the organization, some teams, initiatives, et cetera. And culture, just, I think the main message of this chart really is culture eats strategy. And I'm fully convinced of that. If you don't care about your culture, you will not be successful. You can have the best strategy, the best business model, but if you don't have the right culture in place, you won't be successful. So this means think about premises, think about um, MVPs, think about pivoting, think about intelligent failures are welcome. Your staff is allowed to do failures because everybody does fail failures in innovation projects. Just allow them to do them, to do that and give them the trust that they can also continue afterwards. So, um, yeah, and then it's about leadership, leading my business, leading others, leading myself. And this is kind of the summary. So these are all the three steps. So the why, I hope it's clear why we need to act, why all of us need to act. The what is about thinking about your digital strategy. What is your digital business model you wanna, you wanna um, develop and you wanna try out? 
And then a lot of really about this how to do it, about the soft factors and the digital transformation engine. And then concluding with that one, not everything that is ventured succeeds, but everything that succeeds was once dared. So as this mouse tries to get the cheese, if you want to be successful in digital transformation, you need to try it out, you need to test it, and you need to have the right um, preparation material as this mouse. And I hope I could share with you some of the material that, that help you in the future in order to be successful. Thank you very much. And now I invite Edna for some questions. Thank you. So here we are again. So yes, so we have here one of the first questions. How to, yeah, sorry guys, I, I know I need to make the, the screen bigger. There we go. So, how to find creative people? Bring musicians, artists into the company. They have a very different concepts in their mind. What do you think about that? Yeah, good point, yeah. Think about um, diversity, diversity in terms of functional backgrounds, diversity in terms of um, educational background, in terms of, of where they grew up, etc. And there are also studies around the more diverse your team is, the, the more creative you are. So absolutely, yes. Well, yes. <laughs> Where can I read about the 55 patterns? Um, we, I can send you a link, or we can send out the link afterwards with the homepage so we can, that you can all look at it. Perfect. Where can I read about the company lifecycle time you mentioned at the beginning of the webcast? There's a new McKinsey study, and I, we can also share that. It's a, or it's a Harvard Business Review article, but based on a McKinsey study, and um, I'm happy to put that on the in the material that we send out later on, later yeah. on as well. Perfect. I think it's brand new, it's end of 2018 and they just um, put it in an HBR article. Perfect. Any chance that one person, Janus, optimizes the core while inventing the future at the same time? One person? Yeah. Any chance that one person optimizes the core while inventing the future at the same time? Well, it depends on the size of the business, yeah, and, and, and on your, um, on the time you are willing to invest in, in, in work, but mm -hmm. if you work a lot and if you have a lot of energy and if the business is not too big, sure, why not? You can, you can think about the core business and run the core business and then also invest in, in the new business. That's what leaders need to do anyway, or they, they have their teams that help them, but also they need to be flexible in their, in their head in order to make sure, okay, now I have the meeting on the core business, and then the next minute I have a meeting on, on the new business. Mm -hmm. And then the new business is about moonshot, about making failure, um, mistakes etc mm -hmm. and the other meeting is about no failures and, and and things like that so yes leaders have to do that as well so you can do that as well for, for small business in my view separating red from green treats people like just any other resource go on working until you will be or need any more what was that sorry I didn't, so uh, it's more than a comment more than a mm -hmm. question in my view separating red from green treats people like just any other resource go on working until you will be or need it anymore. But yeah, it's a, it's a good point. It's a very important point because that's, it's very, very challenging. It looks nice on those charge, charts, but it's really challenging to make sure that the red ones, call them the red ones, are not frustrated because they think, okay, we have to bring the money and then those fancy green ones, they can spend all our money that we, we, have, to, um, we have to earn. So it's really challenging and you should not treat them as just resource. Oh, this is my red team, this is my green team, but you need to um, empower them, you need to motivate them, you need to enthuse them about this, this overall story, about the overall purpose of the organization. Why are we doing that? Why do we need you? You are the core people in order to make that happen. And it's, it's challenging, but I think with the right attitude as a leader, it's, it's, you can do it, but it's, it's very challenging. Okay. How do you define creativity when you talk about the staff, since only 2% are creative? Yeah, that's a, there's a whole book about that. It's by Professor George Land. So if you're interested, you can look that up. But um, what he did is like really the, the, it's more about the capability to think outside the box. So to see things differently than typical people would see. Then they took a test from NASA that they usually, usually use at NASA in order to hire their, um, their staff. And then they adapted it. So it's, it's a bit complicated. It's a long study that they did. Uh, but it's, it's about thinking and viewing things differently than other people typically do. Okay. How do you protect innovation teams from standard teams? Mm -hmm. You have to protect them at the beginning for sure. So what I see what works well if they um, work in a separate office, for example. So a lot of companies then have them um, in a shared working center, kind of even together with other startups, like you have all those shared working spaces in Zurich, etc. So you can have the team there. So they are really 
separated from the core team and this already helps. It doesn't necessarily need to be a known legal entity or something like that. It can be an initiative, a team with like people that are really free and can really concentrate on that and then they, you need to um, locate them somewhere else so that they are not always influenced by the core business. And you as a leader also need to pay attention that you don't give them like more work that is that is that needs to be done because they are just there and you have the resources and and that's really um, dangerous because you think okay they have time and now I have this customer problem or I have this profit problem or I just give it to them because they are there anyway no you're not allowed to do that even if the core business then um, is not successful in that period because you lack resources but you're never allowed to take those resources that you have on the green curve and bring them back on the red curve because then you can just stop it and not be successful. How can I convince my boss to put more, uh, more people and money for transform? <laughs> <laughs> well, but, um, I think what, what helps is probably to, to give him the overall story. Why, does, why is it important? Give him some numbers, why um, like the, the lifespan of companies that it really um, came down from, from this high number to 15 years now and really draw the picture why it is relevant to do something. See, Look for examples within your industry where companies are changing, where competitors are changing, where they might be successful, quick wins and stuff like that. So this might convince him. But I think this, the, the need is there and everybody should see it. And maybe it helps to give some numbers, some figures, some studies in order to convince your boss. Shouldn't we replace failing with learning? Shouldn't we replace failing, failing with, with learning? learning? Yeah. We should, yes. <laughs> so for if always if you fail, you learn. So it's a good point. And I don't, do not see it as failing. And maybe I should relabel it because it's always a learning opportunity. If you fail, you learn a lot and you can take that for your next um, initiative. And this makes you better in the next initiative. Nice point. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so we're almost, uh, uh, almost done. So can yes, you share? yes so, I'll share the slides. So, yes, we will share the material. You don't have to worry. So let's see if any more questions are coming. How do you organize the transformation in terms of project management? How do you organize the transformation in terms of project management? Mm -hmm. I don't really understand what is the exact question, but probably, in, I see it so, I don't know if I can answer it correctly, but for me the transformation is that you have project teams and you have project teams that work on the green curve and then the other ones work on the, on the red curve. And as said, you maybe wanna separate them, you wanna, um, give them more autonomy, more freedom, but it's kind of, it's really project management kind of, because you have different project teams working on different topics. I hope I answered it kind of. <laughs> Agile PM? Agile project management, sure. Agile is, is definitely one thing. Agile thinking in sprints and, and things like that, this, this all helps. But in general, you need to be brave enough to, in, to have resources and let them just do whatever they think they should do. And, and you don't have to manage them too much, but Agile and all those ideas coming from lean startup thinking, et cetera, they all help for sure and can be applied in that case. Where do I find more material to the workshops? How do you proceed in your workshops? So more material, want to know more. More material, so yeah, we, if you do an executive MBA, for example, <laughs> you get all the methodology. We, we do those workshops together with you. We apply it for like real cases. So we have we do it with Novartis this year and with um, Google, for example, and with some other micro. And then you really use those cards and you apply them for a company. And at the end of the week, you get feedback from a jury. And then after the, the week, you're also asked to do that for your own company. And then you try to access to do that within your own company. And then we coach you and we give you feedback so that you are really prepared in order to launch that and to push that forward within your own organization. Okay, so now someone is asking for your suggestion because his boss has not a technical background, so he has no, not much of a clue about all the importance of the transformation. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions on how to convince the boss? Well, it's communication, communication, communication. So it's not he does not or she does not have to have technical background. As you saw, it's not really about technology. It's really about thinking strategically and thinking about new business models and new ideas and and, and convincing with studies, with examples from other industries, from your own industries, and then um, make the case. And if you need some more help, we are happy to help you. Good. So, so far, those are all the questions. So thank you very much. And from my side, I just want to say, you know, uh, Dr. Frankenberger, uh, she's not only our academic director at Executive MBA, she's also one of our faculty members. 
and just like her with her consultancy background all of our professors have we can say like a foot in the industry so they know exactly what is happening out there so if you have like the feeling that you know i need to to learn more maybe i need to move away from an expert path and going to more a holistic one maybe you want to update your knowledge or have a filling in the toolbox at the executive mba we have a nice portfolio of programs both in german and in english so if you're interested just um, contact us at any time. And thank you very much. Thank you very much.